It's Wednesday, June 16th. President Biden and Russian President Putin with a three-hour summit meeting in Geneva, Switzerland. I would like to welcome you to Geneva, the city of peace. It is an honor and a pleasure for Switzerland to host you here for this summit and in accordance with its tradition of good offices, promote dialogue and mutual understanding. I wish you both presidents a fruitful dialogue in the interest of your two countries and the world. And afterwards, Biden offers an often rosy take on the possibilities of cooperation with Putin after their one-on-one -on -one summit. I told President Putin my agenda is not against Russia or anyone else. It's for the American people. The bottom line is I told President Putin that we need to have some basic rules of the road that we can all abide by. The dangers of renewed war in the Mideast as Israeli airstrikes hit sites in the Gaza Strip early today. And Palestinians respond by sending a series of fire-carrying balloons back across the border for a second straight day. Further testing the fragile ceasefire that ended last month's war between Israel and Hamas. West Virginia Senator Joe Biden proposes an extensive list of changes to his party's sweeping elections and voting bill, raising hopes among Democrats that they could unite behind the legislation, even if the measure is nearly certain to be blocked by Republicans in a showdown Senate vote next week. The United States will soon have a new federal holiday commemorating the end of slavery in the nation. The House votes to make June... Or June 19th, the 12th federal holiday. The bill now goes to Joe Biden's desk to be signed into law. And the South Carolina Supreme Court blocks two scheduled executions because the two condemned men cannot choose death by firing squad. From Pacifica Radio, KPFA Berkeley, KPFK, Los Angeles, this is the Evening News. I'm Mark Maracle. President Joe Biden says he and Russian President Vladimir Putin discussed in detail the next steps the two countries should take on arms control measures to reduce the risk of war. At a news conference following their summit in Geneva, Switzerland, Biden said this means that diplomats and military experts from both countries will meet for what he called a strategic stability dialogue to lay the groundwork for future arms control and risk reduction measures. In a separate news conference following the meeting, Putin said the two sides had agreed to return ambassadors to each other's nations. Christopher Martinez reports. President Joe Biden ended his first international trip with a meeting in Geneva with Russian President Vladimir Putin. The two-hour meeting did not result in any big breakthroughs, and nobody really expected any. But the summit and Biden's following news conference also went off without any major gaffes, though there was a little one when Biden almost misnamed the Russian leader. I caught part of President uh, uh, Putin's uh, uh, press conference. Indeed, former President Donald Trump was somewhat in the background. Trump's 2018 meeting with Putin, which occurred during the Mueller investigation, is remembered for a joint news conference by the two leaders where Trump took Putin's side against Trump's own intelligence agencies on the issue of Russian meddling in the 2016 election. Trump also avoided areas of conflict, such as human rights. This time, Biden and Trump gave separate news conferences, and Biden did raise areas of disagreement. I also told them that no president of the United States could keep faith with the American people if they did not speak out to defend our democratic values, to stand up for the universal and fundamental freedoms that all men and women have in our view. That's just part of the DNA of our country. So human rights is going to always be on the table, I told them. It's not about just going after Russia when they violate human rights. It's about who we are. 
Putin, in his news conference, turned the tables, saying in the U.S., a person can still get a bullet in the neck. He defended the arrest of opposition leader Alexei Navalny and other moves against political opposition, saying he does not want the kind of riots and looting that have happened in the U.S. But Putin called the summit positive and constructive, and so did Biden. Biden says we'll find out in six months or a year whether Russia will follow through on agreements. This is not a kumbaya moment, as he used to say back in the 60s in the United States, like, let's hug and love each other. But it's clearly not in anybody's interest. Your countries are mine for us to be in a situation where we're in a new Cold War. And I truly believe he thinks that. He understands that. But that does not mean he's ready to, quote, figure the and lay down his arms and say, come on. Biden says the leaders came to agreements on several areas, most significantly the extension of the new START arms reduction treaty, although that extension had already been announced. Biden says he raised other issues where the U.S. has complaints, such as the imprisonment of two U.S. citizens. I also raised the ability of Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty to operate and the importance of a free press and freedom of speech. I made it clear that we will not tolerate attempts to violate our democratic sovereignty or to stabilize our democratic elections, and we would respond. The bottom line is, I told President Putin, that we need to have some basic rules of the road that we can all abide by. Whether any concrete actions come out of the summit, as Biden said, that will only become clear months in the future. But one thing that the summit clearly did was show up a stark difference between the current president of the United States and the former one. Reporting for Pacifica Radio News, KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez. Israeli airstrikes hit militant sites in the Gaza Strip early today, and Palestinians responded by sending a series of fire-carrying balloons back across the border for a second straight day, further testing their fragile ceasefire that ended last month's war between Israel and Hamas. The latest round of violence was prompted by a parade of Israeli ultranationalists yesterday through contested East Jerusalem. A provocation that Palestinians responded to by sending balloons into southern Israel, causing several blazes in parched farmland. Israel then carried out the airstrikes, the first such raid since a May 21st ceasefire ended 11 days of fighting, and more balloons followed. The Israeli army said the airstrikes targeted facilities used by Hamas militants for meetings to plan attacks, and there were no reports of injuries. Masked Palestinians sent a number of balloons laden with fuses and flaming rags into Israel, but neither Hamas nor any other group claimed to have released them. Thus far, Hamas has refrained from firing rockets into Israel, which likely would resume full-scale hostilities. The flare-up has created a test for Israel's new government, which took office early this week. The diverse coalition includes several hardline parties, as well as dovish and centrist parties, along with the first Arab faction ever to be part of a governing Israeli coalition. In yesterday's parade, hundreds of Israeli ultranationalists, some chanting death to Arabs, paraded in Palestinian East Jerusalem in a show of force. Curry Peterson Smith, the Michael Ratner Middle East Fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, with Brian Edwards Tickert, host of the Upfront program. The March of the Flags is a, an annual march that happens on what uh, Israelis call Jerusalem Day, which is a, a day to commemorate in 1967 the Israeli invasion of East Jerusalem, uh, which uh, at that point was not part of uh, Israeli occupied territory. 1967, of course, uh, was the year uh, of the, the war in which Israel seized the West Bank and Gaza um, and the Golan Heights in Syria and also uh, the Sinai in, in Egypt um, uh, and, and East Jerusalem. Um, and so Israel has occupied East Jerusalem ever since uh, illegally, according to international law. And 
this day, this march of the the, the flags, it, it commemorates that that invasion and, and occupation. And so, this involves uh, ultra nationalist uh, Jewish Israelis. Um, uh, it's led by the settler movement, and it is a march that starts in West Jerusalem, marches into East Jerusalem, marches into the Muslim quarter. It is a provocation uh, in Palestinian neighborhoods uh, throughout Jerusalem. Uh, notably, this is a march that was temporarily at least called off last month because of the war in Gaza. And then I guess as a parting gift, uh, outgoing Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu approved it to take place in the opening days of this new administration. Right. You know, it really, honestly, the fact that this march went ahead says a lot about the, the kind of status quo that uh, that. Israel wants to return to in the midst of this so-called ceasefire. So, you know, if we go back to this May, uh, you have a lot going on. You have the tail end of Ramadan in which the Israeli police are provoking Muslim worshipers at the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem. You also have this huge campaign to displace Palestinians from uh, several neighborhoods in East Jerusalem, most notably Sheikh Jarrah and Silwan. Uh, and a lot of opposition, a lot of resistance on the part of Palestinians in those neighborhoods and elsewhere. So it was in that context that the the celebrations for Jerusalem Day, including this march, were actually called off and postponed. Now, as you said, uh, Netanyahu went ahead and said the march should go on, but it's also one of the first acts of this new government to allow the march to happen. They did not have to let this, this march uh, take place. In a way, it's really not surprising, given the fact that Naftali Bennett, the current prime minister himself, is he, he really made his name as a leader in the settler movement, which this march is, is so much a part of. But it really is quite remarkable that one of the very first acts involves allowing this march to go on. And, and to be clear on what that meant, before the march happened, Israeli police moved through East Jerusalem and cleared the way for, for the march. That, that involved arresting and brutalizing Palestinian uh, protesters. And then, of course, the police protected the march as it went forward. So this was not just a march of settlers and, and ultranationalists on their own. This was very much an act of the Israeli government and the Israeli police. And that is the case under this new Israeli government. Curry Peterson-Smith of the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington. Since the ceasefire, Israel has tightened its blockade of Gaza. The restrictions include a ban on imports of fuel for Gaza's power plant and raw materials. In a separate episode, the Israeli military today shot and killed a Palestinian woman who it said tried to ram her car into a group of soldiers guarding a construction site in the occupied West Bank. In recent years, Israel has seen a series of shootings, stabbings, and car ramming attacks against Israeli soldiers and settlers in the occupied West Bank. Most have been carried out by Palestinians with no apparent links to organized militant groups. Palestinians and Israeli human rights groups say the soldiers often use excessive force and could stop the assailants without killing them. In some cases, they say innocent people have been identified as the attackers and shot and killed. The Chinese government said today a nuclear power plant near Hong Kong had five broken fuel rods in a reactor. The government claimed there was no leak of radioactive elements outside the reactor. CNN had reported that regulators increased the level of radiation allowed outside the power plant to avoid shutting it down. It's the second reported incident at the reactor in recent months. The first occurred in April. China is one of the biggest global users of nuclear power and is building more reactors at a time when few other governments plan new facilities because the cost of solar, wind, and other alternatives is plunging. Former President Trump will visit the U.S.-Mexico border later this month as Republicans seek to attack the Biden administration's handling of immigration. Trump, in a statement, said he would join Texas Governor Greg Abbott at his invitation for a tour of the border. The exact location not immediately clear. The Biden administration in its first weeks reversed several Trump-era policies meant to restrict legal and 
illegal immigration. It lifted restrictions on green card applications, undid a travel ban on a handful of majority Muslim countries, reversed the Trump administration's public charge rule, and ended the Remain in Mexico policy that required migrants to await adjudication south of the border. Republicans blamed Biden's swift shift in direction when a record-setting number of migrants surged to the U.S.-Mexico border in the first few months of his presidency. Those numbers have since abated. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KPFK, Los Angeles, KFCF, Fresno, online at kpfa.org. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer says he hopes to hold a July vote on a bipartisan infrastructure bill. But a second measure would be needed to incorporate climate and human infrastructure measures. The top Senate Democrat told reporters there are many in his caucus who think the bipartisan proposal is a good start, but does not do enough. Democrats and Republicans in the 50-50 split Senate have been negotiating behind the scenes on a potential $1 trillion bipartisan infrastructure bill with slightly more than half of that plan consisting of new funding, the rest coming from already approved money for COVID-19 relief and other programs. More from reporter Mary Sherman. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer says he's putting Democrats on the Senate Budget Committee to work today. Now that President Biden's fiscal 22 budget request has been received by Congress, the Budget Committee can begin the important work of producing a budget resolution. A budget resolution will set the stage for passing an infrastructure package through reconciliation. But Schumer still plans to also bring a bipartisan infrastructure package to the floor. Several mayors presented their case for infrastructure investments before a Senate committee. Housing is critical infrastructure. Akron, Ohio Mayor Daniel Horrigan called for federal programs to encourage private real estate development. So did Tempe, Arizona Mayor Corey Woods. Unfortunately, even with our city's own investments, private partnerships and creative use of federal programs, we do not come close to meeting the needs of our cost burden residents nor addressing our extraordinary increase in unsheltered individuals. A national survey found infrastructure is the top priority for mayors in 2021. For Pacifica Network and Public News Service, I'm Mary Sherman. As negotiations in Congress continue on an infrastructure package, a report out today predicts the American Jobs Plan's proposed $274 billion investment to support electric vehicles would boost the nation's economy and create millions of jobs. Diane Bernard has a story. As negotiations in Congress continue on a federal infrastructure package, a report out today predicts the American Jobs Plan's proposed $274 billion investment to support electric vehicles, or EVs, would boost the nation's economy and create millions of jobs. The report says funding new charging infrastructure, manufacturing, and workforce training would yield a $1.3 trillion return in private investment and almost 11 million jobs. Ryan Galantine with Advanced Energy Economy which put out the report, says Virginia would gain more than 93,000 jobs. The big takeaway here is that for each dollar of public investment, it generates $2.60 of direct private investment. That's a good deal for consumers. It's a good deal for the U.S. economy, and it's something that should have bipartisan support through Congress. He notes the move to electric would also add more than $200 billion in tax revenue to federal, state, and local governments. But opponents to electric vehicle switch cite expensive upfront costs and concerns that battery range is limited. Some states like Virginia are beginning to tackle these issues. This year, the Commonwealth's General Assembly created an EV rebate program worth $2,500 per purchase. Galantine adds a move to more electric transportation would significantly reduce air pollution, a serious problem, especially in northern Virginia. Trucks and other high-pollutant vehicles going on regular delivery routes through neighborhoods that have historically been the places where these highways go through. There's some real health benefit there to keep folks suffering from asthma at a higher rate. In 2016, 485 Virginians died prematurely due to ozone and fine particulate matter emitted by cars, trucks, and buses, according to a new study by Harvard University and the University of North Carolina. It says more than 7,000 people died across 12 states in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic. For Virginia News Connection, I'm Diane Bernard.
A group of six young Norwegian climate activists has filed suit with the European Court of Human Rights. 22-year-old Mia Catherine Chamberlain says climate change and the inaction of her government denies her of a belief in the future. It's just a, a completely unfair. I mean, my parents' generations and, and some of the generations before that were able to kind of grow up with this hope for the future. But I have to live with the knowledge that the human race is, is ruining the, the earth that we live on. So that's how it kind of affects me uh, personally. It, it uh, removes all hope from, uh, from my future and, and uh, the future of a lot of other people in the world. The activists argue that the Norwegian government is violating the European Convention on Human Rights by allowing new oil drilling in the vulnerable areas in the Barents Sea. They say the European Treaty grants them the right to be protected against decisions endangering their lives and well-being. Another of the climate activists is a member of the indigenous Sami people who rely on the oceans. He says he fears the impact the climate change will have on the Sami way of life. Solar energy activists were to protest outside the San Francisco offices of the Public Utilities Commission today. They're warning against what they call a utility profit grab that would make rooftop solar systems more expensive. Advocates beat back legislation in Sacramento that would allow new fees for rooftop solar consumers and reduce their credit for feeding excess electricity back into the grid. But the Public Utilities Commission is considering new rules to do the very same thing. Solar energy consumers and businesses say such a step would conflict with California's long-standing environmental and clean energy goals and the growing need for a reliable energy supply in the face of wildfires and grid outage events. Senator Joe Manchin is proposing an extensive list of changes to his party's sweeping elections and voting bill, raising hopes among Democrats that they could unite behind the legislation, even if the measure is nearly certain to be blocked by Republicans in a showdown Senate vote that's expected next week. Manchin, a West Virginia moderate, says he's now open to supporting a bill if it's revised despite declaring earlier this month that the measure was the wrong piece of legislation to bring our country together. He released a proposed list of changes ahead of a meeting of Senate Democrats tomorrow to discuss the path forward. That meeting was called by Senate Majority Leader Schumer, who is vowing to hold a vote on the bill in June no matter what. Manchin says that people were assuming that he was against the bill because there were no Republicans supporting it. Manchin's overture comes as Democrats struggle to counteract state-level Republican efforts to restrict voting following <clears throat> Donald Trump's false claims about a stolen 2020 presidential election. Even if Manchin is brought on board, the voting bill still stands little chance of becoming law. Manchin and other Democrats remain opposed to changes in Senate rules that would be needed to overcome a Republican filibuster. As written, the Democrats' bill would bring about the largest overhaul of U.S. voting in a generation, touching nearly every aspect of the electoral process. It would remove hurdles to voting erected in the name of election security, like voter ID laws, while curtailing the influence of big money in politics. The bill faces universal opposition from Republicans. The bill, known as S-1, has been presented as the best way for the Democratic Party to counteract voting restrictions advanced in Republican-controlled state houses. Vice President Kamala Harris met at the White House with Texas Democrats, whose walkout last month blocked, at least temporarily, voter suppression legislation there. All citizens have the right to vote constitutionally. It is their right. What we are seeing are examples of an attempt to interfere with that right. 
an attempt to marginalize and take from people a right that has already been given. We are not asking for the bestowal of a right. We are talking about the preservation of a right. That is the right of citizenship. On Monday, hundreds of demonstrators outraged at Senator Manchin's opposition to the sweeping elections bill marched through the West Virginia Capitol. Protesters held signs and charged Manchin with enabling voter suppression. The United States will soon have a new federal holiday commemorating the end of slavery in the nation. The House voted 415 to 14 today to make Juneteenth or June 19th the 12th federal holiday. The bill now goes to President Biden to be signed into law. Juneteenth commemorates when the last enslaved African Americans learned they were free. Confederate soldiers surrendered in April of 1865, but word didn't reach the last enslaved black people until June 19th, when Union soldiers brought the news of freedom to Galveston, Texas. That was also about two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation freeing slaves in the southern states. It will be the first new federal holiday since Martin Luther King Jr. Day was created in 1983. The vast majority of states already recognize Juneteenth as a holiday or as an observance. Juneteenth is a paid holiday for state employees in Texas, New York, Virginia, and Washington. And the state of Oregon has just joined them. Eric Tegetoff reports. Celebrated on June 19th, the holiday marks the day in 1865 when Union troops landed in Galveston, Texas, and informed people enslaved in the state that they were free. That was two and a half years after President Abraham Lincoln had issued the Emancipation Proclamation. Raul Andrews Jr. is regional vice president with AARP. So from that harsh reality, of not only enslavement, but prolonged enslavement after Freedom's Bell had rang. We now celebrate Juneteenth as one of the great pillars of freedom in the United States. Andrew says the holiday is a time for people to reflect on our history and the work that still needs to be done toward racial justice. Juneteenth will become a paid state holiday in Oregon starting in 2022. Andrews says the Oregon legislation achieved quite a feat in this polarized political environment. Oregon will be able to say, unlike a lot of other states, they passed the law unanimously. As far as celebrating the holiday, Andrew says we should think of it the same way we think of July 4th. We need to be comfortable doing the exact same thing on Juneteenth with one caveat. And the caveat is a recognition that a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, on top of blood, sweat, and tears, went into making what we now know as Juneteenth, June 19th, a reality. During the 2021 legislative session, Washington State also passed legislation marking Juneteenth as a state holiday. For Oregon News Service, I'm Eric Tegedoff. Abortion rights was the topic of a Senate Judiciary Subcommittee hearing today. Connecticut Democratic Senator Richard Blumenthal noted the high number of abortion restrictions passed in the states across the country in recent years. Uh, The numbers of state restrictions are so numerous that they can barely be counted. Since January, legislators in 47 states have introduced 561 abortion restrictions, including 165 abortion bans. An alarming 83 of those restrictions have been enacted into law, including 10 bans. Several states, including... Texas have passed bans on abortion at six to eight weeks of pregnancy before many people even know they are pregnant. Michelle Bratcher Goodwin, a chancellor professor at the University of California, Irvine, says that's why proposed legislation called the WHPA, the Women's Health Protection Act, is needed to safeguard reproductive rights. She calls the abortion restrictions the new Jane Crow. In states most aggressively legislating against abortion rights, the maternal mortality rates are devastatingly high and reflect glaring, grotesque 
racial disparities. This is a critical aspect of the new Jane Crow. The Women's Health Protection Act deserves your attention and support. It would establish federal statutory abortion rights for providers and patients. Enacting WIPA could trigger the repeal or striking down of the kinds of harmful laws you've already heard about that infringe on abortion access, whose purpose and effect is to make it difficult for pregnant persons to access care. Goodwin compares the Women's Health Protection Act to the Voting Rights Act that ensured access to the ballot box. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK, Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno, online at kpfa.org. This is an hour-long newscast airing each night at 6 o'clock. There is a half-hour edition at the same hour on the weekends. And you can find it archived online at kpfa.org. I'm Mark Miracle. Families facing electricity and power debt held a virtual rally this week to support canceling their bills. KPFA's Daniel Witte explains. Advocates say millions of people across the United States are facing utility shutoffs due to debt, which resulted from the economic crisis caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Groups and consumers rallied on National Action Day for canceling utility debt in support of a bill known as the Maintenance of Access to Essential Power Act, which would cancel any power debt incurred during the pandemic. This includes water, electricity, and broadband. Gwen Chang with the California Environmental Justice Alliance says Californians have at least $2 billion in utility debt, which will disconnect millions of people from life-saving energy. Meanwhile, during all of this, during the pandemic, um, PG&E has continued to raise their rates. Um, their top executives have more than doubled their salaries, and they're continuing to make massive profits um, while typical people, low-income people, the people within our communities are struggling through this time. Um, and on top of all of this, too, California is facing one of the most severe droughts of this year. Chang says that Native communities like hers have been hit hard by fires and health inequities. She says that decision makers need to be turning to these communities for advice since they have firsthand experience. She also says she supports canceling energy for power and water, which are human rights. Chandra Farley, the Just Energy Director with the Partnership for Southern Equity in Atlanta, Georgia, says it's unfair to cancel people's access to water and power as some areas like hers are still reeling from the economic impacts of COVID-19, like unemployment. Uh, my home state of Georgia was one of the hardest hit states in the nation. And at one point, our unemployment benefits filings accounted for over 30% of our workforce. And African Americans accounted for 52% of the deaths in a state that is nearly 31% black. Um, so to juxtapose that with the findings from um, the housing precarity and the COVID pandemic study that a nationwide utility shutoff moratorium could have prevented nearly 50 15% of COVID deaths. Farley says the pandemic has only exacerbated the disproportionate challenges that the black community faced before the pandemic, like low wages for essential work in keeping people safe and sheltered. Beth Pauley, with the Climate and Energy Project, who is based in Kansas City, says her state's energy moratorium expired a month ago and the monopoly utilities have been ruthless towards people struggling to pay them. We have heard many terrible stories. Not only have utilities gone back to shutting people's power off, they have eliminated 
any type of flexibility or what they think of as flexibility that they were offering during the pandemic, which was not anywhere near flexible enough to begin with. We have heard many cases of customers who are in thousands of dollars of debt being confronted with upwards of $900, $1,000, $1,200. In California, activists are urging California to extend its energy moratorium past June 30th when it is currently set to expire. For KPFA News, I'm Daniel Witte. The Taj Mahal reopened to the public today as India, still reeling from a disastrous second wave of the coronavirus pandemic, pushes to lift restrictions in a bid to revitalize its economy. The 17th century white marble mausoleum built by a Mughal emperor in the northern city of Agra, was closed in early April as India introduced strict lockdown measures in an effort to contain a surge in COVID-19 infections that's still killing thousands each day. Only 650 tourists will be allowed inside the presence of the Taj Mahal at any time. The monument normally attracts 7 to 8 million visitors annually or over 20,000 people a day. Neha Punya reports from Mumbai. Visitors to the iconic Taj Mahal will only be able to purchase tickets online with no more than five sold to each customer. Only 650 people will be allowed inside the complex at one time. And all individuals will be required to wear face masks. It marks a huge step for tourism-related businesses, which have reported tremendous losses during the second wave of the pandemic. Doctors, though, are warning against regions unlocking too quickly and people lowering their guards. India's vaccine coverage remains low and a third wave is expected later this year. Reporter Nia Punya in Mumbai. Japan is expected to ease a coronavirus state of emergency in Tokyo and most other areas this weekend, with new daily cases falling just as the country begins making final preparations for the Olympics starting in just over a month. Japan has been struggling since late March to slow a wave of infections propelled by more contagious variants with new daily cases soaring above 7,000 at one point, and seriously ill patients straining hospitals in Tokyo, Osaka, and other metropolitan areas. Daily cases have since subsided significantly, and Prime Minister Yoshidi Suga is expected to downgrade the state of emergency when it expires on Sunday to a less stringent quasi-emergency for several weeks. The Prime Minister has said he's determined to hold a safe and secure Olympic Games that are scheduled to start July 23rd. John Matthews reports. The limit on spectators per venue will be raised to 10,000 or 50% of the venue's capacity, whichever is lower. Watching the games live and in person is still only for domestic spectators. The government has shown no indication that non-delegation members coming from outside Japan will be allowed inside the games venues. The new policy comes as the government is expected to allow the current state of emergency to expire. It was imposed beginning in late April as a fourth wave of COVID-19 cases overwhelmed hospitals and amplified doubts about the risks that games brought to Japan. And that's reporter John Matthews. A state judge has ruled that a Colorado baker who won a partial victory at the United States Supreme Court in 2018 for refusing to make a wedding cake for a same-sex couple violated the state's anti-discrimination law by refusing to make a birthday cake for a transgender woman. In yesterday's ruling, Denver District Judge Bruce Jones said Autumn Scardina was denied a cake that was blue on the outside and pink on the inside to celebrate her gender transition on her birthday because of her transgender status in violation of the law. While Jack Phillips said he could not make the cake because of its message, Judge Jones said the case was about a refusal to sell a product, not compelled speech.
He pointed out that Phillips testified during a trial in March that he did not think someone could change their gender and he would not celebrate somebody who thinks that they can. The judge wrote the anti-discrimination laws are intended to ensure that members of our society who have historically been treated unfairly, who have been deprived of even the everyday right to access businesses to buy products, are no longer treated as others. The group representing Phillips, Alliance Defending Freedom, said it would appeal the ruling, which ordered Phillips to pay a $500 fine. The site of the deadliest attack on the LGBTQ community in U.S. history will become a national memorial. Five years ago, a gunman walked into the Pulse nightclub and opened fire, killing 49 people, wounding 53 before he was killed by a SWAT team. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi said today that she is sending legislation to President Biden designating the site of the Orlando, Florida nightclub as the nation's newest monument. Five years later, gun violence still plagues countless communities across the country. On average, 100 persons are killed a day. The pain in our communities endures, but our resolve to finally end the horrors of gun violence are as strong as ever. In this mission, we are strengthened by the memories of those we lost at Pulse and all of the lives stolen by this epidemic. The mass shooting in 2016 came as Latin Night was being celebrated at the nightclub. President Biden said over the weekend that he has stayed in touch with families of the victims and with the survivors who have turned their pain into purpose. He said the nation must acknowledge that gun violence has hurt members of the LGBTQ community and pointed to what he described as the epidemic of violence and murder against transgender women of color. The South Carolina Supreme Court today blocked the planned executions of two inmates by electrocution, saying they cannot be put to death until they truly have the choice of a firing squad option set out in the state's newly revised capital punishment law. The high court halted this month's scheduled executions of Brad Sigmund and Freddie Owens, writing that corrections officials need to put together a firing squad so that inmates can really choose between that or the electric chair. The state's plans, the court wrote in a unanimous order, are on hold due to the statutory right of inmates to elect the manner of their execution. The executions were scheduled less than a month after the passage of a new law, compelling the condemned to choose between electrocution or a firing squad if lethal injection drugs aren't available. The statute is aimed at restarting executions after an involuntary 10-year pause that the state attributes to an inability to procure the lethal drugs. Prison officials previously said they still can't get a hold of lethal injection drugs and have yet to put together a firing squad, leaving the 109-year-old electric chairs the only option. State prison officials had planned on Friday to electrocute Sigmund, a 63-year-old inmate who has spent nearly two decades on death row after he was convicted in 2002 of killing his ex-girlfriend's parents with a baseball bat. The state Supreme Court also had previously scheduled the June 25th execution of Owens, a 43-year-old man who has been on and off death row since 1999 for the slaying of a convenience store clerk. Both Sigmund and Owens have run out of traditional appeals in recent months. South Carolina's last execution took place in 2011, and its batch of lethal injection drugs expired two years later. There are 37 men on South Carolina's death row. Meanwhile, lawmakers and religious leaders are among Ohioans uniting behind legislation to end capital punishment in that state. Mary Sherman has the story. On Tuesday, groups expressed hope to reporters that the political climate may be right for Ohio to join the 23 other states without capital punishment. Senator Herschel Craig of Columbus is among nine co-sponsors of Senate Bill 103. 
which, like House Bill 183, would abolish the death penalty. It's a salient, critical issue for our state, and particularly with regard to African Americans and the poor. Tragically, we know that many people have been wrong, wrongfully sentenced to death for crimes that they did not commit. We know that. That includes Kwame Ajamu of Cleveland, who spent 28 years on death row before being exonerated. He's worked since then for criminal justice reform, so others don't become victims of wrongful conviction. I was sentenced to die at the tender age of 17 years old, 17 years old. I had not come into the realities of what my manhood would be like. That was still a child. In the U.S., 185 men and women have been exonerated from death row, including 11 in Ohio. Beyond religious objections, faith leaders argue the death penalty is disproportionately used in cases involving people of color. Reverend LeCount Nidab of Massillon thinks racial bias infects every aspect of the legal process. From investigation to arrest, prosecution, sentencing, post-conviction, appeals, and eventually execution. The death penalty is linked to our history of slavery, of lynching, and Jim Crow segregation. Reverend Dr. Crystal Walker with Ohioans to Stop Executions lost her son at age 28 to gun violence. She says an eye for an eye won't bring her son back. The death penalty will not bring closure. The death penalty is not going to bring retribution. The death penalty only causes additional sorrow, additional pain. It only feeds into the violence that is so prevalent in our society. It's been three years since an execution in Ohio because the state can't acquire lethal injection drugs. This is Mary Sherman, Ohio News Connection. And you are listening to the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KPFK Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno online, kpfa.org. This is Kat Brooks. I'm an actor, activist, and freedom fighter. And I'm Brian edwards Teekert. I mostly do journalism, which kind of sounds boring now. And together, we host Upfront, KPFA's local two-hour morning magazine. We bring you breaking news, debates, deep dives. Reporting on City Hall and the State House. Housing and transportation. Prisons and police. And everything big that happened while you were sleeping. And it means the two of us get to hang out with you at 7 a.m. Right after Democracy Now! on Upfront. Andrew Hall, the Contra Costa County Sheriff's deputy charged with voluntary manslaughter for the 2018 fatal shooting of Latimer Arbolita, pled not guilty to the charges today at his arraignment in Martinez. Outside the courthouse, the family of Arbolita rallied, along with supporters calling for the officer to be fired. He's currently been assigned to desk duty. Earlier this year, the same officer... Also shot and killed another person of color, Terrell Wilson. Frank Sterling has the story. Andrew Hall has worked for the Contra Costa County Sheriff's Department for nearly eight years. And in that time has been the subject of three excessive use of force investigations. Two fatal shootings of unarmed men of color. Now he faces voluntary manslaughter charges for one of them, Latimer Arbolita. Jessica Leong is Arbolita's niece. It blows my mind. It's, it's unfair. It's not right. And we want justice. For both men. For both men. For both families. And it's a sad thing to hear. But we're, we're ready to fight and to continue moving forward. His family says Arbolita suffered from a mental illness and was fearful of police. That may be why he refused to pull over when officers initiated a traffic stop of Arbolita in 2018. They were responding to calls of a man ringing doorbells and knocking on doors. Instead of pulling over, Arbolita kept going, engaging in a slow speed chase for nine minutes. Officer Hall was not involved in the initial pursuit, but stopped his vehicle at an intersection to block Arbolita's car. Police video footage shows Hall stepping in the path of Arbolita's car and firing a volley of shots into the windshield and passenger side window. Nine bullets hit Arbolita, killing him. The sheriff's office cleared Hall after a nine-month investigation. But two years later, District Attorney Diana Becton filed two felony charges against him, calling his actions unreasonable, unnecessary force. But Hall says he's innocent. Harry Stern is his defense attorney. 
He fired in defense of his life. There's absolutely no question about that. That's what this case is going to be all about. There's clear and convincing evidence that's provided by the video that uh, shows Mr. Ibolito's car uh, facing directly at him, uh, speeding forward in, a, in an area that uh, he didn't have any place else to go. It's tragic. Uh, any loss of life um, needs to be considered and weighed carefully uh, because it's the worst possible outcome for everybody involved, including the officer involved. It's not enough to say the shooting was reasonable. The question is, was it necessary? Civil rights attorney John Burris is representing the Arbolita family in a lawsuit against Contra Costa County for the fatal shooting. And in this situation, it clearly was not necessary because the officer was in, in a position of safety or could have put himself in a position of safety given the tactics that were used. This officer is the one who placed himself in harm's way. Then he shot into a moving car, his gun, he discharged it a number of times when he himself was not in a position of danger. The, the law is pretty clear that you cannot create a dangerous situation or confrontation for yourself and shoot your way out of it and then claim self-defense. So the challenge will be, of course, is was this officer in a position of safety at the time he fired his, his, his gun into the car? If found guilty of voluntary manslaughter charges and assault with a semi-automatic firearm, Hall faces up to 46 years in prison. Hall's attorney calls the charges against him political. District Attorney Diana Becton filed them one day after a jury convicted former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin for killing George Floyd. But Burris says had they charged Hall sooner, he may have not killed Tyrell Wilson earlier this year. Burris is also representing Tyrell Wilson's family in suing Contra Costa County over that fatal shooting. Hall is the first deputy to face charges for a fatal shooting in Contra Costa County. The families of his victims are calling for his removal. He's currently on desk duty at the sheriff's office as his case plays out. I'm Frank Sterling reporting for KPFA Pacifica Radio. California is one step closer to removing indentured servitude from the state constitution. State Senator Sidney Kamlinger is sponsor of the California Abolition Act. She says the amendment would end indentured servitude and slavery in California prisons. The California Constitution prohibits slavery and involuntary servitude except to punish crime. ACA 3 seeks to amend the California Constitution to remove such conditional language, abolishing slavery and involuntary servitude without exception. Our Constitution serves as the guiding principle for all other state laws. There is no place for slavery, forced labor, or involuntary servitude on our books. If Utah and Nebraska can do it, we can too. Although the 13th Amendment ended slavery and indentured servitude in 1865, California and eight other state constitutions allow indentured servitude for incarcerated people. California prisons expect able-bodied incarcerated people to work. Prison laborers often work for as little as eight cents an hour. And refusing to work can result in fractions which affect an incarcerated person's ability to receive parole or early release. Formerly imprisoned people spoke in favor of the legislation detailing their forced labor while in prison. Jamelia Land says her husband, who is incarcerated, was forced to clean areas inmates infected with the coronavirus without protection. On Samuel said that he was afraid for his life. Because no one knew what we were dealing with, that he did not want to go into those cells. He was told that if he did not, he would be hit with a rules violation, a 115, which in today is the modern day whip, the lash on the back. What that does is, is when he goes up for parole and they see that 115 in his file, they automatically deny him. Colorado, Utah, and Nebraska have passed legislation ending involuntary servitude in their prison systems. Twelve other states are in the midst of passing similar legislation. 
And efforts to ban the practice at a federal level are underway. The California Abolition Act passed unanimously out of the Assembly Subcommittee on Public Safety if passed by the full legislature, would go to the voters to decide on the 2022 ballot. The Federal Reserve signaled today that it may act sooner than previously planned to start dialing back the low interest rate policies that have helped fuel a swift rebound from the pandemic recession, but has also coincided with rising inflation. The Fed's policymakers forecast that they would raise their benchmark low-term rate, which affects many consumer and business loans, including mortgages and credit cards, twice by late 2023. Previously, they had estimated that no rate hike would occur before 2024. At her news conference, Federal Reserve Board Chair Jerome Powell said the Fed's policymaking committee also began discussing when to reduce its monthly bond purchases. Powell made clear that the Fed has yet to decide when it would do so. More from reporter Giles Gibson. Wall Street was watching for signs the Fed will start tapering or easing its bond buying program, which pumps tens of billions of dollars into the U.S. economy each month. But Fed Chair Jerome Powell said asset purchases will continue. These measures, along with our strong guidance on interest rates and on our balance sheet, will ensure that monetary policy will continue to deliver powerful support to the economy until the recovery is complete. Inflation remains a concern, though. A key indicator rose at the fastest rate on record from May 2020 to May of this year. Giles Gibson, Washington. The State Water Board has warned about 6,600 farmers in the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta watershed of possible water cutoffs this summer. The drought has already curtailed federal and state irrigation supplies. It's unclear when the allocations will be cut or whom it will affect. Some farmers have first crack at supplies under a complicated distribution system involving rights holders. Many farmers have already been told they will get little or nothing from two large water allocation systems, the Federal Central Valley Project and the State Water Project. Governor Gavin Newsom last month declared a drought emergency for much of the state, including the Central Valley. The U.S. Drought Monitor says most of California's population is in areas suffering from extensive drought. The Sierra Nevada snowpack, which provides about a third of the state's water, was at just 59% of average on April 1st, when it normally is at its peak. California residents have been asked to voluntarily reduce electricity this week to avert rolling blackouts amid the heat wave that threatens to strain the state's power grid. The California Independent Systems operator says it should have enough electricity to meet demand and avoid power outages, but it is issuing its first flex alert of the year for tomorrow afternoon. People are being asked to voluntarily cut electricity use from 4 to 9 p.m. tomorrow. Triple-digit temperatures expected across California, much of the West, all week. And the San Francisco Bay Area Air District says air quality is forecast to be smoggy and unhealthy tomorrow. The Santa Clara Valley may also experience smoke impacts from wildfires in Arizona and the Southwest. The Air District issuing a spare-the-air alert warning people not to exercise outdoors except for the early morning when ozone concentrations are lower. It's asking residents to limit their driving tomorrow. Mostly sunny in the San Francisco Bay Area tomorrow with highs in the mid-70s around the bay, but highs in the 90s and 100s away from the water. Partly cloudy skies in the central San Joaquin Valley tomorrow, the predicted high 108 degrees and mostly sunny in Los Angeles, a high of 90 degrees predicted. That's it for the news tonight for this Wednesday, June 16th. Thanks for joining us. I'm Mark Miracle. Good evening. Tune in Wednesday nights starting at 7 p.m. with Bay Native Circle. 
bringing you today's native issues, people, culture, and events with weekly rotating hosts. Then at 8 p.m., it's Dead to the World with Tim Lynch, featuring the music of the Grateful Dead, the music it's influenced and influenced by. And the night at 10 p.m. with Sing Out, a showcase of the world's ever-changing music realm, hosted by Larry Kelp. That's Wednesday nights on 94.1 KPFA and kpfa.org. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, and online worldwide at kpfa.org. 